Hi. Hi, how are you? Great, how are you? I'm good. How's your day? It's going really well. How about you? It's going well. Unexpected like every day. Yeah, unexpected. Yeah. I'm um, really I'm with you. So happy that you're here. <laughs> it's a beautiful sunny day here in Santa Barbara, just like every day. I'm, I'm really thankful for all the work that went into making this happen virtually. I know that was initially not the plan, and so it's been so amazing just seeing the work that you've done and um, your colleagues in order to, to make this possible. So thank you. No, thank you for suggesting it. And um, people are still being let in, but, you know, I want to thank you and everybody for this because um, almost everything else this quarter has, like, fallen by the wayside, right? And oh. So I think it's been important to folks um, to know that things don't have to fall by the wayside, you know? Yeah. Um, and I got RSVPs from Canada and Aruba and Colombia, right? Like, so it's a different, um, it's just a different event and yeah. different is good. Yeah, exactly. In many ways, what I'm seeing in this moment is, um, an opening for access mm -hmm. that so many of us have wanted for a really long time. Yeah. And, you, you know, there's always different access needs and people sometimes have access needs that aren't aligned, but, um, you know, in, in some ways this opening uh, through virtual space allows for more of us to participate and us to move at a speed that is, um, more aligned, you know, with who we are. And uh, Jean, my cat, is here who loves to make appearances during all Zoom calls and all Zoom oh. talks. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> it all happen. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so. I'm sure that, well, I have two dogs sleeping by me, and there probably would be a cat and maybe a child who. Love it. Wander. I you know, the thing that I'm noticing in these moments, whether it's like the astrology thing that I'm doing or participating and just watching other people speak, it's like the more that we're able to bring our whole selves and be playful and light about it, you know, like I was doing a talk and Jean jumped up onto the desk and was like, clearly I am not just the main event, but I'm the only event anyone should be focused on and made it really known that that's, you know, what their opinion was. And, you know, it's just as like, it's pretty cool. You get to see um, a kind of like intimate portrait of all of, you know, what is reproducing the public people, right? So like the labor of the cat and the dog and the family and, the, you know, there's so much that goes into allowing us to be out in the world. And when we have this moment where our interior is what is on display, people are like, oh, like that's what's, that's what's letting you do that thing. Mm -hmm. I was um, talking to Matt, my husband, yet again this morning about the awe that I'm in that Marsha P. Johnson has a cat and happy birthday, Marsha. And he, I was like, you don't understand. <laughs> this is the mark of a whole person, a cat. It's like, you exactly. really have a problem. <laughs> you are really a crazy cat lady. And I was like, this is an oxymoron, crazy cat lady. Like, exactly. So, um, I'm going to go ahead, I guess, and get started in just a second here. Um, it looks like um, oh oh, the baby, okay. Hello everyone, thank you for your patience as we've been gathering virtually. Um, are, for those folks who have video on, are you able to hear and see as you would like to? Excellent, thank you. Um, I 
want to um, start by thanking you all um, for being on this call this afternoon, this evening, this morning, whenever, wherever you are. I know that people are coming in from a variety of spaces and time zones, which is amazing and wonderful to me. Um, I, one of my yoga teachers the other day was talking about one of the yogi superpowers is that you collapse the time space continuum and that's what Zoom does. And I'm like, yeah, you know, there are people who've been doing this for a while now, right? Like it is a superpower and I appreciate you all having that superpower. Um, I want to thank the Feminist Futures Initiative and the Department of Black Studies for their unwavering support of this event. And I feel like this is a thing that one says at the beginning of talks, um, but really I want to thank people because there were so many times where it felt like there was a barrier that like, uh, well, this is not going to happen. Um, and then folks um, in the Feminist Futures Collective in particular, uh, Lyle Rube, Jen Tversi, and Matt Richardson, they found a way, right? Like the next day to make it work. Um, and then, of course, the big, biggest barrier came on March 11th when the pandemic was declared and we were like, oh no, oh well. And um, so, Tourmaline, I want to thank you yet again for suggesting that almost every other event that I was looking to, forward to in the spring has been postponed until next year, but um, for suggesting that we use the tools that we already have and that disability justice activists have been using for some time to make this into a virtual event. Um, and so that was a new thing in and of itself, but I hope that it's a first and not an only. And I thought that it was so important that this is something that is happening as part of the Feminist Futures Initiative because um, this is both the past, present, and future. So thank you to all of you for making today happen. I know that there are a lot of people here today. I know that there are a lot of people who have questions um, for Termaline. And so I wanna start with a short introduction. Um, Termaline's gonna uh, make some opening remarks as well. Then I'll start out with a couple questions and then we will turn it over to the chat. Um, and forgive me, I'm looking across from you to read my writing on the same screen. You know, you know how it is. Termaline is an award-winning filmmaker, artist, and activist. Her films include Salacia, Mary of Ill Fame, Atlantic is a Sea of Bones, The Personal Things, and Happy Birthday, Marcia. She is also an editor of Trapdoor, Transcultural Production, and The Politics of Visibility. Tourmaline has received numerous awards, including the 2018 Publishing Triangle Award, special mention at 2018 Outfest Film Festival, 2017 HBO and Queer, uh, Queer Art Prize, and 2016 Art Matters Foundation Grant. Her work has been shown across the world, including at the Highline, the Museum of Modern Art, the Brooklyn Museum, MoMA PS1, The Kitchen, BFI Flair, Portland Art Museum, BAM Cinematheque, the New Museum, the Whitney Museum, MOCA LA, and the Studio Museum in Harlem. Born and raised in Roxbury, Massachusetts by activist parents, Tourmaline earned a BA from Columbia and worked as a community organizer in New York for well over a decade. She served as membership director at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project 2010 to 2014, directed the welfare organizing project at Queers for Economic Justice and organized with Fears. From 2014 to 18, she served as Barnard College Research on Women's Activist in Residence. In the course of this work, Tourmaline came to storytelling as a life-saving trans-feminist practice. She recorded the stories of living icons like Miss Major Griffin Gracie and Egypt Labasia, and unearthed the legacies of Black trans ancestors many of us were told never existed. Through film, Tourmaline recovered, reimagined, rescored, and sometimes bedazzled their stories, bathing them in colored lights, throwing them birthday parties, framing their pain, marking their grief, celebrating the everyday art they made in flights from a realism too small to hold their genders and their generosity. Like many others, I came to Tourmaline's art and activism through her work on Black trans disabled ancestor, Marsha P. Johnson. 
Johnson was a Stonewall veteran, is a Stonewall veteran, founding member of the Gay Liberation Front, co-founder of STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, AIDS activist, artist, model, and performer. Until about 10 years ago, Johnson was mostly a footnote in LGBT history, or I should say LGB history. While this was largely due to trans misogyny and anti-Black racism, ableism also played a role. Wasn't she crazy? People sometimes ask, trying to explain why Marsha got less historical recognition than her contemporaries. Termaly's interventions wrote back against Marsha's erasure. From 2012 onward, Termaline regularly shared written and visual archives of Johnson's life and work on her blog. By 2016, I knew she and Sasha Wurzel were finishing a narrative film about Marsha's life in the hours leading up to the Stonewall Rebellion. I waited impatiently to attend a screening. Like many others, I eventually had to, or got to view it on Amazon Prime. When I finally saw Happy Birthday, Marsha, I fell in love with its vision of this ancestor. The New York Times published a belated 2018 obituary for Johnson that noted, she was usually destitute and for much of her life, effectively homeless. But Tourmaline conjures a home for Marsha. The film shows Marsha getting ready for her birthday party in her own pink painted streamer draped apartment, moving by a dressing table decked with flowers and a pink candle for Haitian divinity, A.C. Freda. Marsha shares this apartment with a cat who meows as the birthday queen pours herself a drink. I loved that this Marsha was connected to the divine black feminine, linked to femme queen, weeping willow, in love with love, queen of imagination, goddess Aisy Freida. But I loved just as much that Tourmaline's Marsha was completely human, a woman with a cat to curl up with. To me, this interpenetration of the divine and human is magic. Black trans ancestral futuristic magic that Tourmaline's films generously conjure for us. Is Marsha a survivor of police violence in this film? She is. Does she have the kind of fugitive relationship to reality we call disability? She does. Does she create everyday beauty and power? She does. When asked by Out how she wants to be remembered, Tourmaline tells us, as someone who is in service of how people's wounds can be beautiful, transformative tools for healing and justice, and a person who makes space for that, for all of us to be present, and reflect back the beauty of that. And this is what she does in the work she shared with us today. Thank you again, Tourmaline, for being here with us. And wow. we can't chat, but just, you know, sign language club. That was an amazing introduction. Thank you. That was such a gift to receive. And again, it really means so much in this moment that we're um, using what we have to still come together. One of the things that I want to spend a little bit of time just grounding this conversation in is the history of people using what they had to come together in moments of crisis, which uh, in Greek has its, you know, um, epistemology and in, in the uh, being a word for a fork in the road, right? And so in these moments of crisis, in these moments when there are forks in the road, I have found a rich legacy of people coming together to use the abundance that's already here to make more of that and to turn our focus on what it is that we want to create, what it is what we want to have more of, what um, you know policies and laws, yes, do we want to change, and what structures and systems, yes, do we want to dismantle, but what is the world that we're looking to create more of? And so to me, part of what Happy Birthday, Marsha is about is that freedom dream of Marsha P. Johnson. Um, in an essay interview that I, you know, when I was kind of doing this archival work, I came across her talking about this freedom dream in 1973. It's um, called Rapping with the Street Transvestite Revolutionary. It's an interview. Um, where she speaks with such precision about how important it is for people to, one, not be locked up, uh, incarcerated, right? How that is a huge barrier to being together, right? And to cultivating our power. 
but also too for the need for mutual aid and community support. She was um, a founder, like you said, of Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, which did really profound work, not just in the streets, not just um, at protests, but also in building a real home for people who couldn't be out on the streets in protest, for people who couldn't do sex work, for people who couldn't work at all, right? It was a real home for people to come together and a place of refuge, um, to receive support, to receive care. And she really modeled that in her everyday quotidian beauty, right? Um, she made a point of meeting people where they were at and being in that place and reveling in it, you know, reflecting back in that kind of Virgo beauty way, that, that power, that beauty that we already have. And then, you know, with Sylvia Rivera, who was a cancer, making a home out of it, you know, and there was that meme uh, years ago of like, when a cancer and when a Virgo combine forces, you get like a beautiful trans revolution. And that's what uh, those two people did. So there's this rich history in moments of crisis, in moments of forks in the road, in moments when we're in the mess of a thing of us turning towards the resources that we have access to, to, to make more, um, to, you know, to protect our community, to love our community and create a real sense of care, right? Um, and that was something that she really led the way in. When I was a community organizer, you know, with the Welfare Warriors and Critic Resistance and um, Sylvia Rivera Law Project, that was frequently something that we were doing, right? We, um, you know, a little while ago, I shared on my Instagram these three freedom dreaming questions that are um, kind of central to how I understand the world and come from this legacy of the Black Freedom Movement, which is also called the Civil Rights Movement where um, people would gather in freedom schools during freedom summer and ask each other questions, right? Trying to not necessarily get to the answer, but have the question be a spark, have the question be a launching pad, have the question be a springboard, have the question be a catalyst for creating the world that we all deserve, right? Creating the world where we're treated with respect, where we're able to live, where we're able to have access to the resources that we need to survive. And so there were three questions that um, were created in this tradition of freedom summers and freedom schools. And they were, what does the dominant culture have that we do want? What does the dominant culture have that we don't want? And what does um, our community have already that we want to make more, right? Recognizing that just like Marsha did, that we're, we have an abundance, right? So back in the 70s, Marsha and Sylvia figured out a way to get, you know, not a great apartment, but still an apartment to build community, right? Figured out how to hustle in ways to have resources. Um, it started with like a trailer home and then it went to an apartment. And so to me, it has been really profound and impactful to pivot my focus, not just to the things I want to change and dismantle, but the things I want to grow, right? Not just to those important places of refusal, right? The refusal of the gender binary or the refusal of a prescriptive way of gender expression. Hi, Jean. The refusal of, you know, the history of um, human, which is so tied up in colonialism and the enlightenment enlightenment project, you know, as my sibling Che Gossett talks a lot about um, the, you know, the making, the production of the human is coming out of the transatlantic slave trade. So to me, that's partly why, like, I always like Jean on, on the Zoom calls, you know, I, you know, it's just really important uh, to constantly be recognized the abundance that we're, we're living in, we're swimming in already. And so, you know, those three freedom dreaming questions really came as the basis of my artistic practice, right? Um, you know, I recognized when I was an organizer that I wasn't hearing stories of people who came before me who shaped the world in ways that allowed me to inhabit it, whether that was Miss Major or Marsha P. Johnson or um, all the cats are out, I love it. <laughs> um, so, right. So, um, you know, it's like, to me, I recognized that, that uh, erasure and it felt so sharp. I don't know if anyone has um, participated in something, I imagine all of us have, 
where we haven't been reflected back, right? Where our beingness has been pushed to the side, has been erased, has been cut down. Um, and the real beauty of, there's a big siren happening. Um, I live next to like a fire department. Uh, I'm gonna put it on mute and close the window one second. Okay. So um, for many of us who have not been reflected back in community, in art, um, in the you know, representations of the world that we're being asked to inhabit, it can be a real place of pain. I know that when I was an organizer, I got extremely angry all the time. Um, not seeing people who were also black trans women being honored for their labor to create a movement that allowed for an event like Pride, right? That laid the groundwork for the kind of liberation that still isn't enough, but exists today. Um, and it was from that place of pain and that place of erasure that I thought, you know, there's something truly profound here. Let me dig a little deeper. And um, we gathered together when I was in the Welfare Warriors, um, you know, in a group and we started to talk about, well, what's our history, right? Um, and we started to trace back that lineage and part of um, that process is shown in this documentary called Taking Freedom Home, which is celebrating its 10 year anniversary. Um, this June, we put it out 10 years ago. Um, and I used to really not like the film and now I, love returning to it always um, because it just shows this beautiful arc of what a community can do in such a short period of time when we're collectively harnessing our imagination, our freedom dreams, our power. Um, so, you know, that erasure kind of sparked these questions and then sparked and catalyzed art making. And um, to me, that is what really my practice is about. It's about looking at that third thing. What is the abundance that is so present that's always here? It's like when I was, um, you know, um, much younger, uh, like I got CDs, right? So, you know, I'm um, going to be 40 in a couple of years. And, uh, you know, it was around when, at least for me, it was like CDs were just like the new thing, right? I had, I had a Walkman when I could afford it. And then the CD player came out and that was really cool. But I would have this experience where, you know, I was kind of ahead of the curve and, um, you know, with some music and I would get a CD and I would not really like it or I'd be like, this is fine or whatever. And then it would take being at a party when someone was playing it and hearing it and people moving to it and moving to the beat and seeing how much joy it was bringing and seeing how much power the sound was creating and letting my body flow in that. And then I would get home and I would put on the CD and I'd be like, wow, I had this since the beginning. Like I already had this thing. Like I had this abundance that I needed someone else to reflect back as being you know, rich and powerful and beautiful in order to fully let it in. So sometimes we need those mirrors, right? And so that is really a lot about what my work is. It's honoring um, kind of spiritual practice that I come from of elders, of people who have created worlds for me to inhabit and to freedom dream um, my own imagination and my own dreams. And then um, just that beauty of like, you already got the CD, you know, you don't have to go out and buy anything. You already have it. You already have that rich, powerful abundance. So, um, you know, that's the Marcia story, but that also extends to Salacia with, um, you know, and Mary of Elfame where Mary Jones was a black trans sex worker in the 1830s and, um, you know, was arrested and 
really um, you know, publicly outed by the New York Sun and the New York Herald, which were two really big newspapers at the time in the 1830s. And this was in a moment of um, epidemic. This was, there was a cholera epidemic happening in New York City. Um, you know, people were fleeing parts of Manhattan. Um, life was also really localized. This was a moment when pleasure gardens started popping up where people who were poor, people who were low income, would um, make it a point to depart from places in the city to go to pleasure gardens, to be with each other, to revel in the deliciousness of open air, of, uh, of you know, quote unquote, clean air. And so, you know, um, that was, Salacia is a real freedom dream about what is it um, like, right? Uh, when someone whose deviance is so delicious, like Mary Jones, um, and goes into a community like Seneca Village that is so important, is so powerful. It was one of the only um, free black communities in New York City at the time in the 1830s, which meant black people could own land and some of them could vote. But there were also these kinds of norms of respectability that were being upheld. So to me, it really allowed um, this like playful imagination um, that City of Hartman talks about in Venus in Two Acts, where what if we disregard or name the archive as something that reproduces erasure and use our imagination as a place of departure to, to create uh, a counter history, a history that um, is just as valid. So to me, that is a lot of what Salacia is about, is creating that just as valid history that um, doesn't exist in the archive, but follows someone else's imagination up, through, up from Soho into Seneca Village, um, and just explores that speculative question, that question of what if. And then um, Atlantic as a Sea Bones is something similar. It's about a moment when, um, as Lucille Clifton talks about in the poem of the same name, when huge violences haunt a landscape, right, um, and call our name, um, what do we do? Right? How do we respond? How do we respond when something really scary comes up that ultimately is a, about a question of our own power, right? Um, and so, and, and comes up for healing. And so, Atlantic Sea of Bones is really about the ongoing haunts, the haptics, the, um, you know, the energetic haunting of a landscape like Manhattan um, that is um, deeply shaped by the transatlantic slave trade and also the criminalization of HIV and AIDS and gentrification. Um, and it follows my friend, Egypt Labasia, through a journey, um, you know, from feeling real fear, feeling real place of being pushed down to uh, a moment of self-actualization um, and, and witnessing what that allows for. Um, and the personal things is just, you know, uh, um, me loving on Miss um, Major, who you know I've known for a very long time now, and has just continued to keep me alive um, in all the ways possible. So that's a little bit about the work and what under underpins the work. Um, and I'll turn it over now. Thank you so much for that, Tremaine. Um I'm just gonna ask one question about Salacia, one about happy birthday, Marcia, and a general question. And um, of course, I just got to see Salacia for the first time in second and third and fifth time yesterday, right? And um, the way that you use a split screen is so evocative, right? Because there's never just one history going on on the screen, right? There's always um, multiple I don't want to say realities, but there's, there's, there, everything is layered. Um, and so I was enjoying that. And then all of a sudden, there's a, on screen, there's a sun. And then Sylvia Rivera's voice jumps out. And I think I literally jumped and screamed. <laughs> and Matt was like, are you OK? Shh, be quiet. Um, and I would wondered if you would speak a little bit to um, and usually the idea, um, and you know, in Saidiya Hartman's work, which I love, and you, you think of voices from the past that come to support us, right? But here was a voice from the, once the past and the future, right, emerging. And it's a very particular um, clip of Sylvia Rivera, right? It's not the um, y'all better quiet down or some of the ones that 
I, I, I see more. Um, and so I'm wondering, could you tell me a little bit about how you um, chose to include that clip there? Okay. So I'm going to answer it in kind of a, a round the, roundabout way, because that's just my style right now, apparently. It's like you don't talk to enough people in a day, and then you just <laughs> all over the place. That's how That's my brain. Always works. my style. <laughs> yeah. So, um, a few years ago, I was working on this film for um, D. Reese, who is a really brilliant director, um, and the film was called Mudbound. And I was D.'s um, assistant, and we. Um, you know, I think it's on Netflix now, it stars Mary J. Blige, it, um, is about, um, you know, a family of farmers, of sharecroppers dealing with white supremacy in Mississippi. And we shot on a plantation um, a couple hours out of New Orleans. So, you know, I was the director's assistant and that involved a whole bunch of things, but, um, you know, it, um, it meant kind of doing, doing it all, right? And so um, part of what it meant, though, was um, I was getting a real insight into movie magic, right? Meaning um, movies create portals to different moments in time. They are doing kind of how you introduced um, our gathering, right? There have been people who have been bending space and time for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it all together right now on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And another thing that does that, at least for me, is film. Film creates a portal for us to enter into um, and experience other moments in time. So um, we were on this truly haunted plantation, um, you know, in St. James Parish, which was a couple hours out of New Orleans. And we were there every day and part of my work um, you know, as an artist and as a person in the world is um, to connect with my lineage and my lineage is people who um, were enslaved in the U.S. South, right? So um, um, throughout the South. And so the landscape was really calling to me um, and it was um, these kind of competing things, right? It's kind of the split screen, the fact that we were on a former plantation that um, is now, you know, the, um, the ground for a lot of film work, right? And also um, the fact that the film was about this other hard, harsh moment um, in the history of white supremacy and black resistance in the US. And so um, I was just kind of feeling that and feeling the portal and feeling how haunted this landscape is and thinking about the Lucille Clifton uh, poem, Atlantic is a Sea of Bones, which I then made shortly after that, um, about how huge violences continue to haunt landscapes well after they're supposedly over unless we're engaged with them, unless we're working for the kind of healing that they are asking and inviting and demanding and seeking. Like they're not haunting for the sake of making us scared, they're haunting for the sake of healing, right? And so um, I had this experience of working on the film on Mudbound and then I was making Maryville fame uh, and Salisha a couple years later and we were filming in, um, in New York City and Brooklyn in the oldest house um, in, in the state. Uh, it's called the Wyckoff House, and um, it was also a place where, um, you know, Black people's labor uh, was, you know, captured. It was also a place that um, held enslaved people, and that history was not really, you know, talked about it, but it was definitely felt, and so I had this moment when I was directing when I um, opened a door in the Wyckoff House, and I don't know how to describe it other than I opened the door and I stepped out into St. James Parish Plantation. Mm -hmm. It was a moment of real movie magic where I was literally with my body walking through a portal, right? Um, and so movie magic does this beautiful thing, which is bend and collapse space and time, right? I felt it, it was alive inside me. And it also does this other kind of magic, which obscures all the labor that goes into creating the frame that goes into creating the image that we see, right? That's part of the quote unquote magic of capitalism is making so invisible all of what reproduces 
the, uh, you know, the labor, right? And I think that's why partly it's so interesting that we're doing all these calls from home. So we're all getting to see a little bit of, well, what's producing that person's labor and what's reproducing that person's labor and there's Gene, you know, and like, um, you know, there's probably some sex going on in the background over there for someone's experience. You know, it's like all of these kind of delicious, interesting things we're all getting a small window into. And so to me, the moment of Sylvia bleeding through in Salacia is exactly about that. It is about what is the ground that is not linear? What is the ground that is constantly folded over and folded over and folded back and becomes so pliable? What is the ground that is always considered supposedly fixed but is always moving, right? Um, and how do moments bleed through and talk to each other? Mary Jones is talking to the future, right, into the 90s, but really being advised by an elder, right, to, you know, Sylvia, who is speaking into the past, but as someone who has gone through it already. And so to me, that is the kind of work that um, spiritual work, that worlding, that portal movie magic that I'm wanting to invite my audience into. And it is meant to be haptic it's meant to be felt it's meant to be moving and it's meant to be in service of the beauty that already exists and also our healing right um you know that moment mary was in prison right and she wasn't really sure how to get out right the conditions are and continue to be really harsh right and that was something that um you know the access to magic, the access to the immaterial, which is what filmmaking to me is always about, um, allowed her to tap into a whole other world, receive support, and from that place, affect her immediate conditions, which I think is something that we're all doing all the time, and I just wanted to, to reflect it back. Thank you so much for that. Um, I... Um, you already answered my other question about that, which is what is what it's like to um, to film with ancestors, right? And there's a way that you talk about it as just it just is, like, you know, it's 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 not um, it's not a choice. It's not necessarily beautiful or hard or it's just it just is. Um, Happy birthday, Marsha, if I may. So there's, um, so I, I wouldn't bring this up, but there's a doc, somebody mentioned this in the comments. There's a, a, a documentary about Marsha on Netflix. There are a couple of, of um, documentaries about Marsha. Um, and some of them that I'd seen prior to Happy Birthday, Marsha, really don't deal with Marsha as um, somebody with a disability, right? And so when I knew that your film was coming out, one of the, I, I, um, I was, stuck in Austin, Texas. I was trying to get to see it, but I, so I asked somebody who had seen it, oh, does this film deal with Marsha's disability? And he said, no, no, not really. And I was like, oh. And then I saw it and I was like, oh, here's the film <laughs> that deals with Marsha's disability, but in a way that that isn't like, this is a film about Marsha's disability, right? This is a film about Marsha, who is all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to what your approach is to, um, representing and speaking to disability in your film work? That's just such an important question. Um, it's such an important question. And it's central to my practice as a disabled filmmaker, as a disabled artist. To me, how I approached Marsha's, you know, Marsha was a person with multiple disabilities and, um, you know, so she was positive, right, uh, later in her life. Um, so there's kind of two Marshas in the film. There's Marsha who is in black and white and who is speaking from 1991 um, in a basement in the West Village, who is an HIV positive activist, who um, is someone who is organizing around HIV and AIDS and the epidemic, um, who is foregrounding that into her into her work always um and then there's the marcia of 1969 right who um is also disabled who has a psychiatric um disability and who has a um very 
privileged relationship with the immaterial. And to me, that was something that was really important, right? To um, not to uh, fetishize or put on um, an altar that um, makes um, and obscures the nuances of what Marsha's life was like, but to fold it into the fabric of her everyday experience, right? Um, and that highlights all of her beauty. So for instance, that was happening when um, every time there was a kind of kaleidoscopic effect, um, Marsha was having a conversation with people who um, no one else could see, right? So she was, um, you know, going to uh, the club and there's two different shots. So there's a shot with her in a car uh, filled with people. And then there's a shot with her alone um, through the, the lens of the police officer walking by herself with a cape, right? And to me, it was really important that we didn't privilege the reality of the police officer who could only see Marsha walking with the cake all by herself. Um, we didn't privilege that reality over the reality of um, Marsha, which that wasn't her reality. She was someone who was taking off her, all of her clothes, walking down Christopher Street and offering them to Daddy Neptune in the Hudson River, right? She had a real privileged relationship with um, the immaterial and also identified as someone who was, uh, you know, living with a psychiatric disability and later living with a chronic illness and later living um, as someone who was positive. And all of those things make up the fabric of the film, right? Uh, and so to me, it's really important and it continues to be really important to foreground that, you know, as much as um, the US, you know, the nation state says like sickness and illness um, aren't, you know, what make up disability, we wanted to make a kind of counter nar narrative of what gets to count as being disabled, right? Um, psychiatric illness or um, ha being positive um, for many people, um, you know, represent placements uh, and relationships with disability. So that to me was something as a disabled filmmaker, I wanted to like really highlight and bring to the foreground. And it was also really important to talk about Marcia as someone who navigates PTSD, right? Like she is someone who like didn't want to go outside again after having multiple, multiple, multiple experiences that were truly traumatic with people who desired her and yet didn't know how to act outside of their role of police officer or, or bouncer or person on the street with more power, right? So she was surviving constantly, um, you know, many forms of trauma. And in um, the interview wrapping with the Street Transvestite Revolutionary, she talks really bluntly, really directly as, you know, someone who has PTSD, who is someone who, you know, she called herself um, someone who is like a cat and she has died almost, you know, like nine times and um, yet she's still here and she's still surviving and she kind of lists these really horrific, really um, traumatic experiences. And to me, it was really important to um, make sure that the ground of the film, right, the very uh, ground upon which all of the characters were moving and all of the story was told started at that place, right? Then also, not as a place of lack, right? So often in our language and frameworks around ableism, um, disability is seen as a form of lack, right? And there's many, many disability activists who are saying, actually, like, let's think about this in terms of surplus, right? Let's think of this in terms of what it allows for. Let's think about this um, when we're making events that are accessible, like how does that, you know, thinking about in the framework of surplus, bring more of us and more uh, of our community to the table, right? And to the conversation, um, which is what's happening right now. So to me, that is like really about, um, you know, both the figure and the ground, you know, in, in art making, um, we talk and think a lot about, well, in order to see the figure, you have to create a ground, right? A kind of high contrast image. So. Uh, a light mark against a dark page or a dark mark against a light page, right? The ground is so important in order to frame the figure. So the ground of um, 
you know, happy birthday, Marcia. Marcia P. Johnson was the figure. The ground is this beautiful, um, you know, expression of the surplus of disability, the surplus of gender expansion, the surplus of the black, black freedom movement that bled into the gay liberation movement, the surplus of uh, street life and public life, the surplus of, you know, being under the gaze of the state and creating and worlding in spite of it in small everyday quotidian ways. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, as you were speaking, I'm reminded that yesterday, um, you know, of course I have a 10 year old who's doing all her school and life and everything here on this couch most of the time. And I'm thinking about something else. And she said, mommy, what's a deficit? And I thought she was doing math. Right? <laughs> and I, I was like, oh, it's like something that's lacking or has been taken away and, and she has ADHD. And she's like, so I have attention, something that is missing. And I was like, oh, mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> That is just the name that people give to these things, right? Yeah. Um, and I had to like stop and reorient and realize that like um, the language that we use, right? Like all the ground that we walk in imagines um, exactly. deficit where there's surplus. Um, and um, and also I'm, I'm really like, I'm, I'm struck and I, you know, I'm not like the idea of um, people with disabilities as being superhuman, um, you know, like why should people with disabilities have to be superhuman? But right. also that like- thing about In terms of putting it on the altar versus, you know, making that the fabric of the everyday life. And the everyday life is the divine as well, right? Like figures like Aisley Freda and Salisha, right? Like who I didn't yeah. know that was, and I found that, oh, that's the consort of, of Neptune, right? Right? Yeah. Like the 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 for all black women, like this is the divine is part of the everyday life, and also exactly. um, in this particular way. I'm going to do something that I dislike when people do to me, so forgive me. But I'm going to read your own words back to you. <laughs> Um, okay. and ask if you wouldn't mind commenting. Last um, March, March 2019, excuse me, you were part of the first out magazine to feature entirely women, I, I believe, the mothers and daughters of the movement. And um, everyone was asked a series of questions and one of them was um, what the greatest obstacles you've encountered in organizing have been. And you said different levels of ableism that are really easy to be internalized about what productivity can look like and what making a difference can look like and just different ableist models of what activism should look like. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to say a little bit about how um, you imagine trans and queer activism would change if disability justice were treated as more central to the work and if you how you see that it is perhaps changing now um, in the era of covid or not yeah, definitely i definitely see it changing i think that what you know there's this great quote um where angela davis is talking about what gets to count as work and she talks about how our interior condition often is modeled after the state. So even if we're against police and prison, a lot of times we incorporate punishment into our responses to harm. Mm -hmm. And she talks about how now people are looking at that and doing work to transform the interior condition mm -hmm. and how that gets to count as part of the work. And to me, I think that that is, I mean, that's just part of what I, my work, my artwork is about, is about our interior condition, about how we feel about ourselves, right? We know that violence is huge, violences don't just affect our ability to earn money or access housing or be, you know, um, alive in this moment of pandemic, but 
they also shape how we feel about ourselves, right? Like um, they shape our immaterial selves, our relationship with our spiritual selves. And I think that I remember, this is maybe like 15 years ago, I, um, yeah, it was like a welfare warriors group. So welfare warriors, for people who don't know, was a group in New York that was made of low income or formerly low, low income, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender non-conforming, non-binary, asexual people, like people in the queer and trans community, right? And I remember going to a meeting and it was about some action, you know, um, stopping violence somewhere, right? And it was impossible for us to stay on a topic. Like we couldn't do it. We could not stay on a topic. And so in that moment, you know, um, some of us were getting frustrated and, you know, we're like no crosstalk or, you know, like we're here for a reason and, you know, take that to the support group or, but, you know, some of us were like our um, quote unquote inability to stay on a topic might actually say more about um the rigidity and the inherent ableism of uh this kind of work that doesn't allow for us to be really present with everything that's going on meaning if it was really impossible to leave a shelter system get on a subway and come to a meeting like that's gonna come into the space right if it was terrifying to go outside because you knew you were gonna have some kind of interaction with somebody that day that was just gonna mess up that good vibe that you had been trying to you know soak and cultivate and get some momentum on that's going to come into the space if our attention is um you know really challenged in terms of like staying on topic like we need to actually be looking at that in a whole other way what is actually here and it's us coming together in the mess of a thing trying to figure something out and just being together so starting at that ground of coming together and to me i think that is a lot of um what i have found so interesting in this moment of like maybe we don't get so specific maybe we don't get so specific with our demands of stopping x y and z thing and you know we ended up being specific and we won the campaigns and that was awesome we got new jails from not you know stopping new jails and we got um new york state to repeal this regulation that denied trans and gender non-conforming people health care under medicaid and we got you know um the welfare office that called hra to um roll out policies that don't refuse trans people from coming in and those are all really beautiful things but in a moment when it's we're really living through the mess of a thing it might be nice, um, some of us were saying, to just be good with the fact that we're coming together because isolation is a you know, reproducer, it is a ground for, it is um, a condition of violence. And so when we're coming together and having that just be the thing that we're focused on rather than the campaign, like that's something that's really beautiful. And if that is the thing that we're focused on, then it doesn't matter if we can't stay on topic then it doesn't matter if we're not um, you know, following the agenda of the meeting. We're actually just looking at the power that we already have, which is being together in the mess of a thing and just milking that and being in that and enjoying that. And then um, you know, from that, we can get momentum. But if we're really getting frustrated with ourselves about um, you know, the fact that we're all, most of us in the group, just like navigating huge amounts of trauma to just get into the space together and we're like upset that we're having trauma responses and we're really activated and we can't get the thing that we're supposed to be doing, then we're gonna, you know, we're working against ourselves. And so I think to me that that's part of it. And part of it is about that kind of dream work, right? It's like, um, like appreciate where you're at and um, you know, notice that work on our own interior condition that isn't about a set of demands or, you know, dismantling a structure and doesn't meet, move at a certain kind of speed or demand that you be outside on the streets that you can do from your bed where many of us are always doing work, right? All different kinds. Like you can do from your bed, like what about that? That's something that's really beautiful and so profound. And so if we start 
um, reflecting back the ways that we are doing these things already, um, to me, that is a kind of shift that allows us to release an ableist mindset about what gets to count and reflect back what we're doing already and move much more quickly to, uh, to more of that good stuff. Thank you so much for that. I, I, um, I think, of course, disability justice models need to do nothing more than to be useful as disability justice models. And I think, um, for example, when I introduce them to my students, it's often this kind of revelation you know, you don't have to, like, you're not a better person or a better activist or a better intellectual if you work yourself into the ground, right? Exactly. And if you, like, compartmentalize and only put the serious stuff there, right? Right. Um, and I, um, that um, I feel These are the like these are the tools that all of us need to survive, <laughs> and that is in times of, of crisis that we we listen right um, to the models that have been here um, all along. Since I moved to California, right, and I'm a native Californian, but I haven't lived here in almost twenty years, and now there's a fire every other week, right? <laughs> like, and then there's this, and like we live in these times of like, um, and I feel like it's been disabled activists of color who already have this, right? Who already know how to get meds when, when stuff is closed and um, who have a system of mutual support, right? Um, which is why I appreciate that in this forum, in this academic forum, that you're like, you know, you're sharing a tool that has been there for a long time, but it's taken uh, something like COVID, right? To recognize that, um, the capaciousness of this tool. Mm. Um, I'm going to try and not be selfish with my questions and open it up to chat. Um, we have uh, uh, Jordan Victorian, who is a doctoral candidate here at UCSB in Feminist Studies, and they have been kind enough to offer to uh, help field questions on chat. So if anyone would like to, I see people using chat already. If you have questions that you'd like to type in, please do. Yes, thank you. And if anyone is concerned for any reason about typing into the group, uh, you should be able to privately message me through Zoom if that's a concern. Uh, but please ask the questions that you would like to. Um, so maybe as, um, got, oh, we'll start with this one then. Thank you. Um, so what are your thoughts on activist scholarship and the role academia plays? Um, can, do you mind repeating it? Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on activist scholarship and the role that academia plays in that? Um, I'm so thankful for it. I think that it is so vital and important. Um, um, you know, I think about, um, like, I, I used to, a long, long time ago, I was um, a research assistant for Robin D.G. Kelly. And, um, you know, he has written so many really wonderful books and laid a groundwork for um, much of the, the work that I do today. And really, um, you know, helped me pivot around thinking about the kind of binary between scholarship and, and activism, right? Like, and then, um, you know, and like activist intellectuals or people who are, you know, not part of the academy, um, but who are, you know, doing that work. So, or thinking about like um, Ella Baker, right? Like, um, who was central to the, um, Black Freedom Movement and, um, you know, uh, was a question asker, right? Was always um, asking really very important questions. 
so you know that to me laid a bit of the kind of groundwork and the viability of thinking about oh well maybe i'm um thinking about this thing as a binary that actually i, I don't need to be and then some years later when i was organizing um you know and that was like my whole life um with the welfare warriors we um, worked with um, CUNY, the um, City University of New York, um, to do a participatory action research group, um, meaning we, um, hi, so what we did was, um, former QJ, -er, so what we did was we partnered with um, CUNY to do something that hadn't been done before, um, at least, you know, in, in our community in this way, which was, we were like, you know, there's a lot of knowledge that we want to share with the world. And there's a lot of, um, you know, insight that our community holds. And there's a lot of uh, questions that we want to ask each other. And so often when um, like reports are made about, you know, community, they come from outside of the community, right? They, a lot of times they don't have anything to do with the community. And similar to how Robin was helping me understand and pivot from like, this binary, when I was an organizer with the Welfare Warriors, um, we created this um, participatory action research group with CUNY, and um, we had like a research collaborative, right? So it was called the Welfare Warriors Research Collaborative. And, you know, maybe we could have thought of a sexier name, and um, that's, you know, fine, you know, looking back, but um, it was like sexy work that we were doing. And so, um, and, you know, it was, asking each other really important questions. And so then we made a document um, that, you know, is um, one of the only documents that exist um, from this moment about poverty, about um, disability, about navigating, um, you know, getting, um, you know, social security benefits or welfare benefits or living in homeless shelters. Um, and it is a report that still exists, you know, it's from 2010, it came out with the um, documentary Taking Freedom Home, um, and it's called A Fabulous Attitude. And similar to, you know, the documentary, like, I tell everyone all the time, like, check out A Fabulous Attitude. Like, this, we started this in 2007, we started, you know, writing up and reflecting back and sharing the really important disability justice models that were happening in our community. Like, that was like 13 years ago now. Um, and uh, we put it out in 2010 with the, with the documentary. And so to me, I really think that um, all the time, all the time we're modeling ways um, for, um, you know, liberation that are about, um, you know, scholarship that are about, you know, um, you know, academic work and academic institutions and people in flight from them and uh, making space in the undercommons of them um, to do work that is transformative and beautiful and powerful and um, that, you know, uh, changes people's lives. So thank you. Um, so got quite a bit of questions, thankfully. Um, one theme that touches on maybe two of the questions um, is about the use of material, physical space versus digital space for community building and activism. Um, so part of that being, I guess, how do you see that changing over time? Um, and then also what are you know, potentially some of the pitfalls of, say, using social media, um, but also the potential limit to reach new audiences and these other um, just potential yeah. that it has. That's such such an important question, you know, and I think um, it's really important for all of us to be thinking about access and the limits of the spaces that we're creating. You know, we want to bring everybody, right? And we want to go where everybody is. Um, and we want to make sure that the the things that um, we're creating are accessible to, to, to the people who, you know, our community who needs them most. And so, you know, back um, when I was at the Sylvia Vera Law Project, part of our work was making events, IRL events. We weren't doing digital events. 
but um, a lot of our community was incarcerated, meaning they couldn't come to the Thursday Know Your Rights session. They couldn't come to the Thursday um, movie night or discussion or, you know, things like what we're doing right now. Um, people couldn't come, you know, they were in prison. And in fact, they still continue, a lot of them to be in prison, you know, the same people today. So we had to get creative. We had to remember that there's not ever going to be one strategy that is um, uh, like the answer to a set of questions that are abundant, right? Which are about access. And so we also had to think about momentum and speed. So um, if we're making all of our decisions at a meeting that only one person could be a part of, uh, or sorry, rather only a particular group of people could be a part of, like maybe uh, we needed to slow down a little bit and figure out other strategies to make central the decision-making power of our incarcerated community members. And we did that, we did that all the time. So part of that is letter writing, you know, part of that was um, Gabriel Foster, who now is the director of the Trans um, Justice Funding Project, was really uh, instrumental in um, making a newsletter, right, that was about creating um, not IRL, not digital, but like old school paper community, right, um, you know, that was sent back and forth between incarcerated community members and people on the outside who um, similar to that kind of false binary of like activist academic, like a lot of us are both, right? A lot of us are moving back and forth between many different kinds of institutions. So to me, when I think about access, I think about speed, I think about slowing down, I think about wanting to bring everybody, wanting to know and remind myself too, with a lot of gentleness and love, there's not gonna be just that one strategy that allows for everyone to be here in this moment, other than, astral projection which is kind of where i'm at right now and so like that you know it's like that's the immaterial that is that magic right that is that tapping into lineages and traditions that um you know we're we're dreaming with all the time and so you know other than those that kind of beautiful set powerful tools like what are some other ones and i would say like know that there's not going to be just one um, know that it's important to be playful and take it easy and ask questions. Know that um, there are going to be times when some things are accessible to some people and others are not accessible to other people, right? Like there are times when there's like seemingly uh, contradicting or competing access needs, right? Um, and be abundant about it, right? Like make sure that we're abundant in our solutions because um, we're coming from problems that are really overwhelming um, and that invite us to uh, slow down and feel the abundance. Thank you. Um, so a few of our questions touch on the theme of the future of trans politics. Um, and one, uh, so the Feminist Futures Initiative that um, I'll put this on. The theme of this spring is focusing on that question, what is the future of trans politics? And some other people had questions to that end. Um, and that was, of course, before COVID, uh, but this becomes even more of a pressing question because of the pandemic. Um, and what you said earlier about thinking about the world we want to make um, is exactly sort of the project of the Feminist Futures Initiative here. Um, so the question is, how are you thinking about the future of trans politics now, um, given this moment and given all that you've sort of done and know um, from your own work? Um, and also, what are different ways, um, including in BNOM, that we can reimagine a future that advances trans justice and visibility? Yeah. Um, you know, for, it's so funny, like, Kind of going back to the that moment when um, we, you know, we would do the welfare warrior trans justice groups, and we were supposed to be talking about a set of things, and um, my friend Tracy Bumpus, who um, was an activist uh, out of Housing Works, which is a really important organization that focuses on housing and um, you know. 
uh, as you know, part of a response to um, the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, I remember, you know, going to a meeting and um, just being like, you know, I had a hard time getting here. And, you know, someone else was like, you know, save it for the support group. And Tracy Bumpus said, you know, like, this is the support group, you know, and um, Tracy Bumpus died uh, in 2009 um, in, in San Francisco. Um, and, you know, left this huge legacy of activism um, and about like sometimes um, when we're asked to um, think about the future, it's actually really important to like pause on that question and um, come to a place of like feeling good in this present moment. And so to me, that's kind of where I'm at right now, which is um, in many ways, I have tried to release as much as possible my specific desires about what I want to see in the future and get really general, like go for a general feeling, which is I want to feel good. I want to feel like me and my loved ones and my community and people of the world have access to the tools and the resources that we need to survive. I want us to be able to go from, um, you know, uh, being the mess of a thing to finding ways to be laughing and having pleasure and being, um, you know, like playful, um, even in these harsh conditions and conditions that have existed in our, um, you know, the ground upon which like the American empire stands, right? They've never not been here. And so I, when I go pretty general, like about the future and I just, I think about, well, the feeling place. What's the feeling place? The feeling is I want us to feel good. I want us to feel like we have power. I want us to remember that we have power. I want us to remember that the power um, existed before us in this moment. I want to remember that even in crises, we can reach for uh, each other. We can reach for our power. We can reach for our playfulness. We can reach for our desire. And then when I get into a little bit of um, momentum around that, then I allow myself to get kind of more specific, which is, you know, um, like, what do I want to have for dinner tonight? But like, that's kind of like, you know, some days in this moment, like, I don't really get that far with the future other than I want us to feel good. I want us just to remember our power. I want us to come together in that power in the abundance of ways. I want us to, um, you know, dream up a different uh, set of conditions. I want us to think about and feel through what we already got that is keeping us alive and and um, put our focus on that so we can create more of it. Um, you know, I think for me, just personally, just with where I'm at in terms of like my brain, which is so beautiful, um, I can get like spun up really fast. Meaning like if I think a thought, it, that beautiful thought will make more thoughts like it. And when something really scary is happening and I'm thinking thoughts that are filled with fear, that generates a lot of momentum. And I, then I am in this moment of like, well, how can I think as few thoughts about as few things as possible to bring myself down and really be in this place of like, you know, like, okay, what do I need right now? And um, sometimes that can be a little bit at odds with thinking about the future, you know, thinking as few thoughts as possible. Thank you. So to shift a little bit more um, to the films, which you spoke about some, um, and about your form and technique. Um, so one of our questions uh, says that your films are experimental bliss and that they are like visual poems. Um, and part of the question is, are there trends of color visual aesthetics or innovations um, that you see both, I guess, specifically through your films and more generally, um, perhaps thinking about your work with Trapdoor? Um, and then after that, a question for Dr. Tinsley um, and her work, uh, does trans of color fem feminism require that we see differently? These are such beautiful questions. Um, like, um, it's so clear that everyone here has put a lot of thought and uh, work into being here, right? Like we're in the middle of, um, 
like a pandemic and people are like making really beautiful questions and people are figuring out you know how to get an internet connection to be with each other in this moment and um talk about things that really matter right which is our dreams of um you know the world that we want to inhabit and um what does that look like what are the textures and the feels uh what is the aesthetic of it um you know i um think constantly about the you know the aesthetics of my work this is a long answer coming again so the aesthetics of my work are tied to this moment of um stonewall where in new york city the new york um police department had a moral code that didn't allow um you know trans people to express um you know their gender our gender fabulousness so if you were a trans woman and you weren't wearing three articles of quote unquote male clothing you could be arrested and put in jail so miss major talks a little bit about that in personal things and to me that was a real kind of pivot point where i was thinking about well you know that's literally the fashion police right that is i mean literally that's the fashion police they're policing with um you know the carceral state people's fashion and expression um and i think about you know suzanne farr who was an organizer with southerners on new ground um in the highland center talks about you know um things that are places of um sites of oppression are specifically um offering a tremendous possibility for liberation right like the state wants to push it down because of its capacity and power for liberation and so i started to think about that through that lens well if our aesthetic right that beautiful trans aesthetic is being criminalized and um you know in, in incarcerated um is being penalized and pushed down while well, there must be something there that offers a profound possibility for liberation and so you know that was my entry into art and what is there is a deep destabilization of the gender binary and the state right new york city had a moral code that was at odds with the incredible fashion the incredible aesthetic of largely trans people of color who were you know as a moral code that was policed um in public space so if you were taking up space in public with your super saturated fabulous trans aesthetic you are at odds with the morals of the state and isn't that such a beautiful thing to know that like our very being is at odds with the you know business as usual of a state that is not something that allows for our life to begin with you know isn't that a really wonderful wormhole like a uh, trap door into figuring out how to dismantle some things that we don't want that don't allow for us to be alive and so to me that's really about the aesthetics of my work it's about realizing and remembering we are powerful in our fashion in our aestheticization in our expression and so powerful the you know the state and it's like moral code is freaking out trying to deal with us like we have a lot of power just by showing up as who we are and so to me that's kind of like what the heart of my like super saturated look or um you know the way that i approach um aesthetic these kinds of aesthetic questions thank you and uh dr tensley if you wanted to add um i'm just going to be real brief yes <laughs> um feminism with a uh, double m does require us to see differently to me i don't use fem the way some people do now which is as a code for all feminists of center folk to me it's a specific response to a lived experience of, and i'm talking about black feminism racism um misogyny homophobia and transphobia um and i think one of the things to me that is a key experience of being a black femme is being and this and i'm only saying this because i think it's in line with you've already with what you've already said termaline the experience of being too much right my shoes are too much my earrings are too much <laughs> my big feelings are too much right and that that is um i am a double pisces so that what um to me um 
I, I said I wasn't going to say this publicly, but here now I am. If, if you have watched footage of Marsha P. Johnson and have not fallen into it, I don't, I don't understand, right? And to me, what I, one of the things that I would watch over and over is where Marsha talks about transform, like, like things that were trash, right? Flowers, <laughs> broken lights, like these all became it. It, it you know, she. Um, she, she says, like, I never did drag seriously, right? I didn't have that kind of money. Right. And, but it's not about having that money, right? It's what's built out of that which is too much. And that that's like, that there's a kind of radical ornamentation. And that doesn't mean that people have to be high femme or whatever, right? Like my 10 year old did my makeup today, but like, I'm not always about that life. Um, but that in that of making um, a space of resistance from that which um, other people have defined as being too much. Um, and so then, yes, that requires us to see differently, not to see something as trash, right? <laughs> to see um, the beauty, to see, right? Like what, uh, what Tourmaline has already said, that there is already abundance um, that doesn't look like capitalist, <laughs> right, <laughs> accumulation. Um, and to recognize that that's a lot of freaking work. That's a lot of work because there's a lot that tells us that our vision is um, lazy and crazy and all kinds of other things. And so it's also honoring that, um, that work. Yeah. Okay. So one more, um pulling up sort of on the aesthetics um, question. We have a specific question about uh, Atlantic as a sea of bones. Um, and they're asking sort of about this scene where Egypt is submerged and then Jamal reemerges in the water. Um, so if you could talk about that particular moment um, and more broadly also, um, how you're thinking about the human as you discussed some earlier um, and what alternatives to the violence of the human that Black aesthetics and Black trans aesthetics make possible? Yeah, these are really deep and, and important questions. Um, the moment of going through the bathtub was in many ways about the Lucille Clifton poem, uh, Atlantic Sea Bones, about um, entering into a portal that connects you to a haunted landscape for the purpose of healing. No longer being able to push yourself down far enough that these powerful energetics um, that are showing themselves to you every day, whether you want to or not, are unavoidable. So in that moment, there's a kind of multiple different things going on. One is um, Egypt is entering a portal and um, the ghost character um, played by Fatima um, comes up and um, really forces a confrontation about power, about ignoring or pushing down your power because of immense grief, because of loss. A lot of times, you know, many of us move through the world and we're told, well, if you're having a hard time, it's because uh, you, you did something wrong, you know, um, and you dressed too much or it was, it, you know, you, were, you weren't tucking or people could tell you were trans, you weren't fine, you know, it's like you weren't fitting yourself into this mold, right? Um, you were you were too much, and so to me, um, it's about really addressing these questions that there, you, you know, you can't um, push down your power far enough in order to make the world okay with you, and so it is about Egypt slowly, you know, the character of Egypt slowly, slowly letting that in and going through that portal to allow. Uh, confrontation which then turns into like a connection for healing with what is haunting Egypt 
which is an incredible loss and a lot of pain, which is um, a landscape. You know, I want to say a little bit about this. So Egypt and I, we, we worked together. Um, Egypt was the coordinator of trans justice. And one day we were making this campaign. I talked a little bit about it, about stopping the welfare office from being so transphobic. You know, many of us um, you would go in and they would say, no, come back when you look like a man or no, come back when you look like a woman. So New York City doesn't give you nearly enough welfare benefits to, to survive, right? And for many of us who are transgender forming, like that's what, you know, one of the few things that we need in order to survive. But there was this barrier to even getting in the door to get this little bit of benefit in order to survive. So it was, it's a survival question, right? Welfare is a survival question. And so we would meet regularly and Egypt one day came in um, with this big coffee table book and it was about, um, you know, the meatpacking district in the 90s and Egypt, um, you know, was going through the pictures and was like, that's me. And it was, Egypt looked amazing. And then was going through a little bit more and was, this is my friend and this is, this is my other friend. Oh, look, at this. everyone just looked so good. It was the 90s. And so... Um, then, you know, towards the end, Egypt kind of had this realization in front of me, which was, oh, like, actually, all, everyone in this book is dead. I am literally the only person still alive that is in these photographs. I mean, she knew every single person in the book. And then she had this other realization, which is, oh, like, no one ever asked our permission to be in this book. Like, um... They didn't tell, they didn't pay me, they didn't, you know, get my permission to, to be in this coffee table book or whatever. And so we started talking about how those two things are really entangled, right? How, um, you know, enormous um, loss and a life that is shaped by loss and a, a landscape of loss is also shaped by misuse, right? Um, and we wanted to create a kind of experience um, where art, which is so powerful, um, can exist as a portal for healing. And so that is in, in many ways what that moment was about. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions, uh, sort of thinking about femmes and femininity. Um, so one asking for recommendations or tips for trans masculine people of color um, in supporting trans femme folks of color and bringing their experiences to the forefront of conversations. Um, and maybe also thinking more broadly, um, given sort of the devaluation of femininity, um, what are ways that we can sort of have a paradigm shift that really acknowledges the beauty, the creativity, and the power of being femme and a femininity? I mean, I think that it's about, you know, so, sometimes I'm like, sound like a broken record, but like we're doing it already. You know, it's, it's literally that, um, it's in moments like this, these moments of coming together that we're doing that work, right? So it, it kind of goes back to, you know, a lot of times we think um, the more we do, the more we're worth. The more we do, the, you know, the, the better we are, or the more we do, the better the world will be. And I just want to say, like, we, um, there is no thing that we could do in order to be more worthy. Like, we're, in, we're worthy because we just came into the world this way, right? Like, there's nothing that we could do in order to be, you know, um, deserving, like we came into the world this way. So if we can kind of accept that, like, we don't have to do extra, and we're doing it already right now, then um, the kind of, um, there's something that opens, where we see the abundance that's already here. And it's about just like, in this moment, reflecting back, like, we're literally doing this work. So that's Jean, Jean's doing the work too. Um, you know, it's like, um, it's just conversations like this. It's being playful about it. It's releasing all sense of urgency, right? Like, um, and putting pressure that, is, that if we like, if we're not doing it right, then we're not, you know, worthy people. Or if we do it right, then we're more deserving. Like, 
we're doing it. We're figuring it out. We're in this mess of a thing. We're in yet another crisis. And yet we're coming together, having some of the most profound conversations I've ever experienced in my life. So it is just continuing to be part of this work that is already happening and not adding like an additional thing to our list. Like we don't have to add an additional thing. We're really doing it already right now. Um, so another question. Uh, first, um, thanking you um, for the important work you've done. Um, I'm here with the Senior Seminar in Feminist Studies, and so appreciate the way you contextualize survival and ongoing forms of exclusion in society. Um, and right now, as you pointed out, we're incorporating more practices of inclusion that disability justice folks have been doing for a long time. So from that perspective, what advice do you have for young people graduating into the world as it is right now? I'm trying to, um, I'm just looking at the chat too to the question. Um, my advice for young people graduating into the world um, is to take it easy, to just, you know, it kind of goes off the last thing. It's like, really try to take it easy. Like, um, you know, I talk a lot about freedom dreams and the lineage of freedom dreaming and the lineage of question asking and the lineage of the Black Freedom Movement. A lot of times when people are in a very hard time, you don't have access to huge dreams about transforming the state. You might have actions, access to dreams about like, okay, I, I can't, um, you know, for whatever, I can't go outside right now, but maybe there's like a way that I wanna put my hair, or maybe there's a way that I wanna do my makeup. Or maybe I want to dream up the kind of dreams that I have tonight. Or maybe there's um, kind of like a, a bath or like listening to, um, you know, I'm listening to a lot of Laraji right now. Maybe it's like a lot of like music that, um, that kind of quiets our mind, right? Like our big freedom dreams don't have to be in this moment when we're just having such a hard time about huge conditions changing. They can just be about where we're at right now and how we want to feel between now and going to sleep, now and waking up, now and eating breakfast, now and maybe being able to go outside, now and having a FaceTime tomorrow. Like they can start really small. And I think that that is what I'm just this whole time really trying to encourage us to um, start with where we're at, right? That is about a, a beautiful liberatory disability model. Start with where we're at, right? And that allows for so much more. Release the urgency about how we have to like, within this moment of pandemic, figure everything out. Start with like how, you know, um, like what kind of thirsty DMs do I want to get from somebody, you know, like that, that's a beautiful freedom dream. Like that is okay. Like maybe that's all you can allow for right now. Um, and to me, when we just get into our condition, when we are like, okay, this is where I'm at, and we are easy about it, we're playful about it, that's when, in my experience, when we have been able to transform the most. So it's not saying like, okay, like, we're, you know, well, I'll just think about the thirsty DMs and the world will be how it is. It's saying when we feel the best, when we're playful and funny and allow ourselves to be fully present, well, then wouldn't you know it, we transform the world. We think of real easy strategies to stop jails from being built, to allow access to welfare, from, you know, get New York to, you know, get trans people, you know, allowing for our healthcare. Like we, we change and transform the world. So what I'm inviting is an opportunity for us to start at a kind of more general sense where we're feeling good, where we're dreaming, where we're taking it slow, we're being gentle, we're being really easy with ourselves. And we know that that is the ground upon which we can first dream, then imagine, and then transform the conditions.
Thank you. And one question I have actually, sort of, I guess, on the topic of freedom dreams, um, in terms of just thinking about filmmaking and your creative work, I guess if you could make whatever sort of film or creative project you could, you know, and you didn't have to think about all the logistics and stuff, like what might that look like? That's such a great question. Um, you know, like right now I'm trying to make a lot of like porn memes and uh, funny things and um, just like really, I, I'm trying to bring the humor up. I was having this experience where I did this residency at Amherst College and they played all my work at once. And I was like, wow, this is really beautiful, but it's a lot to handle like in one sitting. Like these are some really <laughs> heavy questions and they're filled with beauty. Like I never wasn't doing that. But maybe the next thing that I want to do is like a porn comedy or some kind of thing that's just like really playful and meeting people with that like lighthearted spirit because it takes me back to when I was organizing where like the funnier we could get in the meeting, the, the more powerful our strategy sessions were after that, right? Like when we were all just joking around with each other and we let that vibe, you know, cultivate and get some momentum then we got to a place where we just were unstoppable. We, you know, if you look at the past decade in terms of like trans liberation movement, I'm not saying like everything is better and you know, whatever, but like there's been a profound shift. And I've been here for all of that past 10 decade of watching this profound shift. And I wasn't here for, you know, the thousands of years before it, but I have witnessed in my lifetime what can come from like that playful spirit. And so I think now in this moment, I'm just like, well, you know, um, I am looking for like a keen sense of humor. I'm looking for pleasure. I'm looking for the people who are doing that. I am um, I'm wanting to laugh more, you know, when, um, you know, a friend of mine, Lorena Borjas um, died of um, coronavirus on uh, March 30th. And, you know, it was heartbreaking for me and, and my community. And, you know, over the course of being an activist and um, just living my life, I've just had a lot of, a lot of my friends have died. You know, a lot of trans and gender non people of color who I've loved, I don't, I can't count them all. You know, it's like many, many have died. And in this moment, so I kind of have like a practice, like, you know, this is how I respond to my grief and this is what I do. But in this moment, the, the thing that I was thinking about with Lorena was just like, she would come off the elevator um, at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. And, you know, it wouldn't matter if everyone was in a meeting or um, we were doing something really serious. She would just scream, you know, like, you know, Shanks, you know, looking for this one particular brilliant lawyer who now works at the ACLU. It, it was like the, the doors opened and it was her show. You know, and it was like, you know, we, we were doing a lot of different things, but she was just larger than life and it was hilarious. And it changed the whole energy of the space. It, she was funny. She was funny. She was powerful and she was funny. So I think to me, I, in my grief, I'm like, oh, wow, she was like, she was really funny. She just got off the elevator and started screaming, you know, Chase looking for Chase, who inevitably came out, was so happy. And then, you know, what did they do? They made a bail fund. They made something that was deeply connected to Marsha B. Johnson's 1973 Freedom Dream about um, how trans and non-conforming people need money to get out of bail, need money to get out of jail. They need bail funds. Most trans and non-conforming people are currently incarcerated because they can't afford bail. So it's not like um, that humor was disconnected to the powerful things that she did, but she got off the elevator, she started screaming, she started laughing, we were all falling out, and then bail funds were made, then collectives were made, then models for mutual aid were made, then moving slow and bringing more was made, then getting people out of prison was made. So to me, I'm like, okay, I am just, I'm just like enjoying that memory and wanting more of that in my art right now. Thank you. Um, so one of our questions, uh, one of the areas that our feminist studies department particularly um, has been expanding recently um, is on queer migration. Um, and the question is, um, especially now during this pandemic, the question of carceral state and detention uh, needing to be forefront um, and how black and brown bodies are being exposed to literal death in jails and detention. I guess, how do you see 
um, your work sort of speaking to those questions, complicated questions around carcerality and um, in this moment where we're seeing these conversations in different areas? Yeah, I mean, all my, all my work is about, um, it's, it's not without, uh, I mean, it's all central to, from my activist work to, you know, so I grew up um, as a child of an incarcerated parent, you know, like that's part of what was going on for me is like, I would, um, my dad was in prison for most of my life and, um, and that had a profound effect on how I felt about myself and my sense of shame. And um, it wasn't until I met um, other people who like were able to talk about it freely about how, you know, we live in a world that, um, you know, manages populations through prisons that I was then able to have a kind of profound shift about, you know, uh, abolition and incarceration and criminalization and doing organizing work around that um, from like stopping new jails from being built to uh, working at the Subway River Law Project, you know, making art with people who are currently incarcerated. Um, you know, that informed my Marshall Johnson work and, um, you know, Salacia takes place in a prison, you know, um, it's central to all of it. But the condition is the prison, but the theme is freedom dreaming. It's about following the arc of liberation using both material and immaterial tools to um, change the condition of the prison. Thank you. I think that was the last of the questions I have down. Cool. These are great questions. I mean, it's, it's so powerful to be in conversation with everyone here. Y'all are just thinking with such precision and such power about really, really important issues. And you're not just thinking about them, you're question asking which to me is, um, you know, the catalyst for all change always. So you're, you're holding this profound moment. You're allowing yourself to be with other people, to feel the feelings of, you know, the, the crisis that we're in that isn't separate from the ones that came before. And then your minds are just like moving so fast and so beautifully to deep, deep, poignant questions that, allow for more of us to show up, allow for more of us to create with each other and play with each other and, you know, be in our power with each other. So um, thank you for inviting me into that. It is such an honor. Thank you so much for being here. Like this is, um, it's been an amazing afternoon for me. Um, and if you don't mind my saying so, I love your hair color. Thank you. <laughs> it's like, I've seen it on Instagram, but here, like, it's really that um, beautiful water sign green. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I, um, I, if anybody has any questions that they want to send, me or uh, later, I'm happy to answer them on my behalf. Um, the, this event has been recorded. It will be um, posted um, at a couple, on a couple of different sites at, at UCSB. If people want a link to that, please feel free to use the Feminist Futures 2020 email, which is just me. It's just me. <laughs> like, <laughs> Um, and like, I'm happy to send that link. I know that there are people who asked ahead of time, um, can they pass it on to other people? And this is absolutely um, meant to be accessible to everyone um, afterward. So um, feel free to pass this on to anybody who um, wasn't able to be here today, but will be able to view it in the future. Um, and I like just, Thank you. This was really a gift today. 
Um, thank you to Tremolaine and thank you to everybody. Thank you, um, Jordan Victorian. Like you are awesome <laughs> at moderating questions. Yeah. Um, and thank you everybody for, for showing up and being thoughtful and bringing thoughts and feelings at once. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone. Um, so I, 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 I guess I'll go ahead and end the meeting. I hate, like, I hate doing this, but, um, again, thank you all. And please do feel free to, um, to stay in touch and hopefully there'll be more events for us to join in sooner rather than later. Thank you everyone. And again, sign language claps. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.